so I just drove in from New York today, and so I'm, I'm a little glazed over and highway hypnotized. Uh, so the meeting's going to be real informal. Um, I've got a set of slides to basically cover the container, Docker, and a product that Red Hat just released called Atomic. Uh, we'll cover all that territory. Um, my name is Christoph Dorbeck. I'm a principal solutions architect with Red Hat, which basically means I'm a pre-sales engineer. So I work in sales, but I've got the, uh, hang on, my mustache, just to prove you I had it. I've, I've got 15 years, you know, almost 18 years of uh, prior experience being a Unix system admin. So lots of background, and I shifted to the darker side of sales when I joined Red Hat. It's been a great ride since, so it's been a great company to work for. Uh, I'm joined by Brent Holden. Hi, my name is Brent Holden. I'm the chief architect for Red Hat's East Region and Financial Services. I do not have the uh, previously 15 plus years of being a Unix admin, um, uh, but I was a uh, previously an operator for Solaris, Irix, AX, and Linux uh, back in the 90s uh, for both the internet service provider, the University of Connecticut. Um, I was the head engineer for a startup in Connecticut for several years. Uh, then I joined Red Hat uh, coming on eight years ago. Um, I can't believe it's been that long. Christoph actually mentored me when I came on. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that's some of my background. My expertise is actually within OpenStack. I'm considered one of Red Hat's global uh, subject matter experts. Uh, but um, you know, part of what we're going to be talking here today is about uh, Docker, Atomic, uh, Kubernetes, um, and um, really uh, what we want to demo towards the end was a project I worked on pro called Project Kala, which is about provisioning OpenStack using Atomic, Kubernetes. Uh, we'll get to that towards the end of the show. Uh, so I have a standard disclaimer. You know, we participate in this as a kind of a share information. So you know, we do the best that we can to make sure what we're telling you is accurate. But you know, if you're going to do anything in your own company, you always double check your facts. You know, work with the experts. So just be, be smart, careful. Um, all right. So the conversation of containers isn't really anything super new. I mean, uh, variants of IBM. Big Iron has been doing some form of containers for a while. But what is new is um, the method by which open source is now delivering containers and the way we make workloads portable and more deployable and scalable, all the buzzwords that you want to run a modern data center with the cloud term, right? So Google uses everything at Google, uh, runs in a container. Every microservice that Google provides is containerized. Uh, OpenShift is a Red Hat product that is PaaS, also based on container technologies. Quick show of hands, <laughs> who's not familiar with containers at all? Excellent. All right, so. What, uh, which version of containers does Google use? <clears throat> so there's, um, when we use the term container, uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can implement a container. Right? So Docker is what we're going to talk about tonight. That's one way to do it. Uh, the OpenVZ project was effectively a type of container, um, that type of pair of resolution. Actually, when I break down what the technologies are, we can cover Yeah, that. exactly. You have SE Linux. And yeah. So you know, Google had a mechanism they used uh, for delivering containers that they basically use SE Linux and a few other things on top of it. So are they kind of leading the pack? Is it people, are people following Google? When you talk about leveraging containers at scale, Google is really the, the lighthouse everyone points to. Thank you. you know, so they, they, they deliver on the average, you know, I think their statistics are like 2.4 billion containers a year. And you know, that's just services that they spin up and spin down on demand, really. You know, so whenever you, you know, have a Gmail account that gets created, they spin up a container for it. That's a good example. Thank you. Um, show of hands, who's familiar with traditional virtualization like VMware? All right, everybody. So everybody's familiar with the concept. You set up a virtual machine, you install the entire OS, and then the, your hypervisor, the platform that provides virtualization, is emulating CPU, memory, disk, <coughs> network, and whatever, so that the VM thinks it has real physical hardware, but it's really not. And that basically allows you to have a, a portable workload. But the downside to that is you lose performance because of all the emulation, and you, and you lose some, um, um, some performance. And what was the other one I had? Anyway, come back to it. I told you I got this highway thing going here. Um, so anyway, so what's different now is that when you 
shift away from virtualization of a, of a physical piece of hardware and you move to the container story, you've now moved the, the virtualization out of the hardware and into the operating system. So we've essentially, for the things, if you think of an application and the dependencies it has on an OS, like you run a database, database needs to have IP address, physical storage to talk to. There's things about the operating system that it needs hooks into. So when we talk about how do you build containers is you virtualize those pieces so that the application can run on the OS without the hardware emulation so you get better performance, scalability, et cetera. And that's so it's where still we're like about. one kernel or what happens? Like so in a container model, you have one kernel running the whole machine and then the container will have just the runtime and the application, you know, basically the application has everything it needs to run. Yeah. So what you lose is I need to install an RPM that is my database and that database depends on, you know, a version XYZ of Python. But now the problem is, is that XYZ of Python introduces a breakage because there's something else on the host that depends on a different version of Python, right? So the container allows you to bundle everything that's required including everything for the runtime and the application, and then basically have it like a Lego block, you move it around. Okay, but if you've got two containers and one of them hangs the kernel or whatever, then everybody stops? Yeah, yeah. theoretically, I mean, they, they, so I mean, when you, um, if you look at this model, I mean, just graphically, like this, if you were to draw a virtualization in traditional, it would look very similar to this. Like this. Yeah, exactly, um, and so really, you know, the, there is that both a security risk and um, you know the theoretical that like if you were to find something to DDoS a kernel, you could take down all the apps on the machine. That is a theoretical, right? But that's the same theoretical risk you'd have using the hypercall interfaces as well, you know, on a virtual machine. So the same is true for you know running ESX. If yeah. that kernel dies, the whole machine hangs. Yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. So you know I, what's interesting about a, about the container model is that because you have a single shared kernel. Um, the, the way a container presents itself is it's very similar to a Unix shell. You know, you guys have been doing Unix for a long time, most of the folks in the room. Chirut. Yeah, right. Chirut. So when you look at a, a Unix shell, you're confined to a certain part of, the, part of the file system. But a Unix shell is very easy to break out of, especially if you're root. And that's really where containers um, begin to take hold, is that for a traditional, um, for a traditional Unix container, or rather a Unix shell, you would have a shared process space. Um, between the jail and the host. And it was easy to break out of that if you were a root. It was actually designed to break out of it. Within a container, you have one process namespace for the container and a separate process namespace for the host. It's a very different model, so it looks like its own OS instance effectively, but you're sharing the kernel between the host and your container. It's a very different way to think about how to deliver applications because when you think about how you bundle apps as long as, uh, along with libraries and things like that. It allows you to spin up instances of applications with their own entire user space in milliseconds. That, that's the use case that containers is designed to solve. So it just occurred to me, have you heard of a practical or theoretical limit to the number of namespaces a kernel can have or support? Yeah, I'm sure there's like some practical limit of like 65, 535. I mean, I don't know what that kernel structure is that represents how many PID, yeah. how many process namespaces that you can hold. I'm sure it's hard coded in there. Can you call Larry real quick? <laughs> yeah, get Larry on the phone. <laughs> um, okay, so slides like this will appear throughout, so I'm sure we'll probably be repeating some of this discussion here and there. But you know, in the traditional model where you do virtualization, your VM layer is here, and you're basically deploying multiple OSs on top of, uh, of the hardware platform. Your virtualization in the container model happens inside the container at the host OS. Right. So, the, the, so the, for the folks in the room in the traditional Unix, uh, Unix space or Linux space, the one on the left is your gold image, right? That's the image where when your, your app dev team deploys a new app, you're going to update your gold image to support their app. You're going to push that gold image out everywhere, and then you probably have like some sort of shared file system mechanism, whether it's NFS or AFS or whatever, to then deploy that app. Uh, throughout the infrastructure. And that works okay, uh, but to Christoph's point earlier, when you start requiring multiple runtimes, like you need you know, Python 2.4 and 2.6 and 2.7 and 3.2, you know, for all these different apps you want to stack on one machine, those things can conflict. Um, and so the problem that container solves is that 
you're then bundling user space along with a single, what they call an entry point, a single binary. Um, so if you want to run something like MySQL, you would bundle the only enough user space that MySQL needs to run along with the MySQL binary. And then when you start your container, you're executing that binary within its confined user space. So all it sees, if app A was more IDB or MySQL, when it spins up, all it's going to see is the user space associated with that container. It doesn't see anything on the host. It doesn't see anything on the other containers. And from an administrative perspective, you know, you have a VM, you SSH into the VM, and it looks and smells like an operating system. The same is true. If you SSH into the container and explore within the container, you wouldn't see that you're running on another host. It's, it's almost like it's its own operating system all to itself. It has its and own process name space, its own network name space. Okay. So that's this so. next slide here. So when it comes to implementing container technology, there's basically four key areas. Uh, what we've been talking about, this name spacing, that's this process isolation. You know, how do you make the process think, you know, that if the, if the user ID of the process is, you know, one, two, three, four, five, how does that process not conflict with the user ID of one, two, three, four, five in another container, right? So you can have containers using the same user IDs, but actually having a map to something completely different. Um, so there's a whole bunch, I'll come up with that in the next slide. Uh, resource management, you know, the basic fundamental principles of I've got this container or this, you know, this virtual application I need, but it can only get four gigs of memory. It's only allowed 20% of my CPU, you know, resource management. That's another key. Um, how am I going to stand up the container and manage it at scale? And then lastly is the security piece. You know, as he's talked about, when you cheroot the container, you don't want the, you know, an exposure in a, a web server to basically triple to where now somebody's got access to the host platform. Mm -hmm. And so Red Hat solves these in this set of technologies here. So we, we're using what's already been in RHEL 6, uh, something called C groups uh, or control groups. And within that infrastructure in the kernel, you can basically manage and uh, control CPU, memory, network, and block I.O. allocation to processes. Because a container is nothing more than a process, same is true here. So we're just using C groups for that. And then there's namespace, basically, you know, IPC, uh, the process IDs, the mount point is probably the easiest to understand. Um, you know, when we talk about an application that comes along with its own uh, runtime, it includes, uh, bi you know, binary files and like user opt, whatever, and you install your pieces in there, you can include bits and pieces of a file system in the container that then overlay the operating system's own file system. <coughs> so that basically gives the container access to everything the host provides plus whatever it needs for it to run. So, uh, yeah, so in terms of the file system, like, you know, in user, slash user, slash var or something, mm -hmm. it's, it will it sort of inherit what's on the host? Or you control so that, or? In, in the container world, you know, I'm not <coughs> talking about Docker, in the container world, yeah, that's user definable. You can say what is the, where is the line of demarcation between what the host shares with the, with the container. You can throw it all the way into the host shares everything so that the container really is just no the app. Way, basically. But then you lose the flexibility of you know patching host versus app. So, kind of people still like the separation of if I've got my entire runtime, everything that's required in this machine, then I can I can upgrade all the components in without having to deal with upgrading the host or patching the host. Second, so we'll, we'll get into that and how we're solving those places. Um, networking, you know, container application might need its own IP. You know, you don't always have to share the host IP. So how do we do that? Um, have a unique host name in a container. You know, it doesn't mean that the, the application has to use the host name that's provided by the platform. You might actually configure its own host. Um, and then the user ID space. Um, when it comes to management, when we first started this conversation, so I did this similar presentation last year uh, as Red Hat was getting ready for um, our Red Hat Summit over on the uh, West Coast in uh, San Francisco. Um, you know, we said the management story here was uh, libvirt LXC, which basically is a, you know, libvirt is a uh, API for virtualization management, and they had an extension to support Linux containers, uh, but basically you can strike that and it's all Docker now. The whole story, every, the, whole, the industry seems to have gone with Docker because like I was talking about earlier, they're a company that sprinted to the finish line first and said, hey, we've got a, a solution that helps people build a container deploy the container, and then manage the container, and you'll see all that whole story. I think um, 
If I actually if I can set up. So for management, part of management is not just spinning up containers and spinning them down. Uh, part of it is that on disk format that I was talking about earlier. And um, you know what's compelling about Docker is that it really did emerge as a community standard for uh, container format. And so what that means for you as an individual user is that a lot of the ISVs have gone on to building the application specific to the Docker format. Now there are different management frameworks now. Um, if you've been paying attention to that community, there's, uh, you know, Livert LXC has kind of gone to the wayside as um, Christoph mentioned, but there's Docker and there's a new management framework, framework called Rocket that's built around uh, CoreOS. And, you know, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. You know, CoreOS have the reasons for debuting it. Really that Docker image format, when it comes to management and deploying containers, that really is a gold standard um, because it does make containers portable across different uh, OS instances. So if I'm running, you know, one Relatomic instance over here and I'm running another one over here, I can take that same container, deploy it on both and run it, you know, so it makes a very easy pattern for me to replicate. I think, uh, you know, people look at patterns like, you know, your traditional, like, Apache web services or MySQL or SQL servers or, you know, any tool that you're you constantly reusing makes a great pattern and Docker format has emerged as the standard for containers. All right. So, lots of great public announcements about Docker and how wonderful everything is. And the, the model has become, so there's this thing called the Docker registry. You can configure and install Docker on your Linux systems and then do a Docker pull and go get MongoDB and go get all these things that people have already created as downloadable containers. And because of this registry, it's almost like going to Google Play or your iStore or whatever it is and saying, you know, just install something and launch it and go. It's that easy and it's that fast. But that introduces a lot of problems for you know, enterprise companies that want to do things that are you know, supportable, uh, avoid risk. You know, you don't want to be installing machines that have or installing containers or software that include you know, Trojans or whatever. So, a lot of uh, issues that come around trust and uh, you know where the sources come from. Um, and then there is you know a basic survey as you know why are why are containers kind of this, this wonderful utopia? Um, and you know the, the idea of deploying apps faster. So if you haven't ever launched a container before, if you run a VM, VMware or KVM, whatever, you run it, you get the BIOS, you get the kernel boot up, the kernel has to do hardware discovery, it starts services, and so just like a physical machine booting up, a traditional VM does much the same thing. Container world, it's like you're just starting a process from my database. Boom, it's up and running. When it's done, end of line, finished, it's out. So that's where this, this concept of quick delivery is very important. And then if you can shrink your services to where they're you know, small and tiny, then have something called microservices, so that you basically start something, it solves a problem, it finishes, and you run that a thousand times over, now you can scale it to provide you know, services that deal with mobility <coughs> or cell phones or whatever. Yeah. Um, so there's something, on. Yeah, there's something we're talking about when you talk about reducing the effort to deploy applications. Um, you know, one thing that I see a lot of people coming on to, especially within our customer base, is that containers make a great endpoint for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, what that means is that as uh, companies are adopting new ways of delivering applications, they basically want to take a developer who's writing code and take that code and push it either directly into UAT or push it directly into prod um, as they're adopting, uh, you know, more agile methods of, of deploying apps. Now, containers fit in because it makes it really easy to deliver a pre-integrated, pre-tested uh, bundle of the app and user space. So that way, if a developer wants to take something from their laptop and say, I was developing here, I know it works, I don't have to then replicate this whole virtual machine and this whole environment and all this user space I don't need, allows them to carve off exactly what they need and then deploy that into a prod, and you can automate that very easily. So I think that deploying apps faster and reducing effort to deploy apps, huge reasons for deploying containers. Okay, so stupid question. I just want to set up a lamp stack. Can I, is there some place I can just download a Docker container that's got everything ready to go and I just type two lines of code and it's ready to go or two lines of command? Yeah. So, so theoretically, I mean, the, so this is like more of a theoretical for containers. Containers are really designed around uh, the concept of microservices. So instead of having one container that does everything, you know, both uh, web serving, 
and MySQL and your app, right, and all that code, um, you would effectively break that down into I have a container for Apache, I have a container for MySQL, I have a container for my app, right, and then they're gonna, all going to communicate on this private network that they develop between them. So, oh, I see. so they, they sort of have a structure of internal IP addresses you got or it. something. So that's what uh, Kubernetes that's kind right. of solves. So in Kubernetes, <laughs> you use the term, uh, terminology called a pod, and in a pod, you you tie together your microservices, your containers, and then you deploy the pod, and then Kubernetes stands up all three required pieces, stitches together a little network, and then boom, your service is up and running. Yeah, and that is both a, I would say, a strength and a weakness of containers, is that a container is really designed around the single execution model, the single entry point, right? So you're gonna run a single binary. Now that single binary could theoretically be like a system D or a supervisor D, and that could spin up other things underneath it. I think That's the not really what is the architecture yeah, exactly. It's really designed for like, I want to run the MySQL binary. I want to run the Apache binary. I want to run my app binary. Right? So now you don't have to worry about incompatible libraries between, you can pick whatever version of exactly. Apache or MySQL or whatever, yes. and then they can they talk to each other over a standard. Yeah, they, either they talk to each other over a standard Unix pipe or a standard IP connection. Cool. That okay. almost sounds like microservices. Almost sounds like microservices. <laughs> In summary, why containers? So faster app delivery, deployment flexibility. Um, this means so because um, containers are a kernel-based technology, doesn't require virtualization. Uh, it's complementary to traditional work. So you can do containers in a VM to basically get better efficiency out of your VMware platform or KVM. Uh, but you can also deploy technologies into Amazon and enable containers there as well. So now my pod or my containers, I can basically throw into my data center here or throw them into Amazon and they're basically very portable. It's one image format that can span both local traditional vert or like an OpenStack type vert or um, you know, a cloud like an Amazon or Google Compute. You see like a lot of investments from Amazon and Google Compute specifically around supporting containers because they want to enable that model where it's easier to fork up apps into their platform. Comparing it back to traditional virtualization, you do forfeit something, and that is the separation of you know host OS and kernel from hardware, which means any container really has to run on a like system. So Linux on Linux, not mixed Windows, <coughs> Linux workloads. If you're doing a container model, it's all Linux. But you can mix uh, kernel versions. So as long as you're within the you know within the limits of certain compatibility. You can have, for example, uh, RHEL 7 with Docker containers enabled, have it do a, a Docker pull with a, uh, a RHEL 6 base OS, and then running you know, things that require RHEL 6 on top of that. So you can do mixed version deployment, but not mixed host OS like Windows to Linux. Um, you know, operational. Are the requirements on the kernel version being similar? Or I, think like, I don't know how the yeah. dependency between the, the application library and the I think that's a great, great question because to that quote that Christoph put up earlier, that's a problem that it's trying to address and point out and saying that when you have a specific kernel, right, like we ship within uh, within RHEL six, not that it supports uh, kernel yeah. containers, but two six thirty two, we, we ship two six thirty two, right, and so that's going to we, we test that kernel with our user space and our glibc and our you know all that other stuff, and when you talk about the RHEL seven kernel, you know three dot ten. You know, we have to go through a very specific process to guarantee that a RHEL 7 kernel can run a RHEL 6 user space. Now, I think what, to your question, right, can I run like an Ubuntu user space on a RHEL kernel? You know, no one knows the, what the, you know, those interoperable, uh, that interoperability is. So that's why I think the author of that quote wanted to point it out that you can't just necessarily, it's not like a, well, I've got this one container, it's going to run on every platform. You really do have to understand this user space is going to run on this kernel, are they interoperable? Now that's a problem that Red Hat's trying to solve, but we're not trying to solve it for you know, community distributions because there's really no support organization to lean on. I mean, do you see in a way that this ultimately will maybe replace package management in some <coughs> way that, that it becomes a primary mode of distribution that you will recommend a container to launch MySQL instead of 
installing yeah. the VM or the dev with like 73 dependencies? Yeah. I think, you know, if the, the, the two, I think, it's a good question. The, the two really are orthogonal to each other. When you're developing a container, like it's really great to go into the Docker build file and say, yum install on MariahDB, right? And just have that run and then you have a bunch of commands you run at the end to set it up. And that's all you need to do rather than like CPing binaries around. You know, that's really what the function of RPM is, right? That you don't have to do that. Um, so I, I do think that for, um, for apps that require a lot of configuration around them, um, that, have, that have been solved, I think, you know, people look at the at SQL databases because those are apps that require configuration, but that's really a known quantity to a lot of people in the community, right? Most people have developed these, uh, you know, uh, how to deploy MySQL and have those SOEs. They've been working on that for years and years. So I do think for certain types of apps that have configuration associated with them, that's going to be the sweet spot for containers. Um, for a single binary that doesn't require a lot of configuration, <coughs> that's where RPM really shines. Yeah, so it's a container to open in a text editor or something. That's right, yeah, exactly. All right, anything that we haven't covered here already in some sidebar conversation? <coughs> we're going to talk about the networking and how Kubernetes, and we're going to cover Kubernetes here next. Yeah. Uh, you just tried reporting, ease of use, yada yada. Okay, we've covered all these. Yeah. Okay, um, why don't you do Kubernetes since you've already kind of covered the majority of it? Oh, um, yes, okay. Um, so yeah, Kubernetes is, um, so let's talk about what it is, what it does uh, first. So Kubernetes was um, a mechanism for orchestrating containers that was based on some of the research work that Google did. Now, I said earlier that Google deploys 2.x billion of containers per year. That is a true statistic. Uh, they did release Kubernetes. Kubernetes is not the tool that they use. It's taking all the best practices and all the things that they learned about orchestrating containers and putting it into an open source project. So Kubernetes was open sourced in a, a collaboration between <coughs> Red Hat and IBM. <coughs> Excuse me. It was designed around creating this uh, declarative framework so that way if you wanted these multiple hosts running, you know, Docker format or some other container mechanism, if you want to deploy your app in a way that you can describe it within a text format, then some sort of template, and then have a system be able to deploy it out amongst multiple hosts, that's the problem that Kubernetes solves. It's around container orchestration. Kubernetes will also do, um, you know, things around like network configuration management, also things around uh, network namespace management, uh, so that way if you need apps that either depend on each other uh, or containers that depend on each other, so if you have a, uh, let's say like a web, uh, or like an HTTP app or container that may need to depend on your app or, uh, or a SQL container, you can define those relationships within the spec. Uh, so it's very powerful. Uh, Kubernetes uses a terminology called a kubelet, <coughs> Excuse me. That's the um, uh, that's what's called a it, it's worker node here. It's actually a, a minion within the framework. So we have a demo of it towards the end that we can show. Uh, so when you actually tell Kubernetes to do something, you're feeding into the master. Hey, I want you to deploy this pod. Um, a pod can be uh, you know either one or multiple containers. Um, within I mentioned Project Kala earlier. Uh, you know. And Project Call was sort of designed around uh, deploying OpenStack, so I'll use some OpenStack terms. Uh, when you break down an app, uh, let, let's say Nova is an app with an OpenStack, Nova can be broken down within you know, five different types of sub-applications. So you have the API server, you have uh, the uh, Nova and C proxy, you have the conductor, um, <coughs> you have the scheduler, you have all these different sub-apps. And so you can break Nova down into five different containers, uh, all running the single daemon each, and all those five get deployed simultaneously as a pod, and that is the Nova application. Um, and you can deploy multiple apps on multiple machines, um, <coughs> and the idea is that you know these pods may or may not have a relationship to each other, um, and so as we'll see later, you know uh, you can define that relationship, or they can be completely different, completely different apps that are completed, fed in by completely different developers. Um, you know, so we already talked a little about microservices. Um, you know, there is, a, there is definitely some work that Kubernetes is doing to uh, expose more of the Docker runtime features. So um, some of the things that you could expect from Kubernetes is that it will deploy your app as, an app as a pod. And then you also have to create what's called a service definition that will actually expose ports that are um, usable from outside the cluster. So if you deploy your 
HTTP app, you have to deploy your Apache container, but then you also have to deploy a service that then describes that, uh, that um, Apache app to make it reachable on port 80. So there are things that Kubernetes does that um, expose some of the features. It's not going to expose them all. It's going to expose the most useful things. All right, so let's take a breath and who's completely confused? All right, we're still kind of on track. You <coughs> lost? No, no, I'm not lost. I did have one question. Um, so I understand that there's one underlying OS, but you're talking about running different kernels in different containers. Yeah. And that kind of lost me. No, not different kernels. Different user space. Different user ah, space. Okay. Okay. You're you still running the same kernel, but the, the thing is, so the, the user space, you can basically package up the user space for RHEL 6 and put an application that has dependencies on the RHEL 6 uh, runtime and then deploy that onto a RHEL 7 host that's running Docker containers. Yeah. So if you entered every container on the host and ran uname minus a, you would get the exact same result from every single container on that host. Yeah. Yeah. Even a RHEL 6 running on a RHEL 7. That's right. You'll see the RHEL 7 kernel in the RHEL 6 container. That's right. So it has to be something that kernel then can't have some kind of compatibility with your application, like you kind of have to test it out. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, most most applications don't interact with the kernel directly. Most applications are going to interact with the um, the syscall interface that GLC is going to provide. Yeah, but right. sometimes there can be a button. Yeah, like absolutely a right. Or something. Absolutely. Right. So if you install a very specific device driver, yeah. and your application depends <coughs> on that device driver, yeah. you have challenges to overcome. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Now, part of the story of, of Docker and containers and Red Hat strategies. This next topic will be uh, the super privileged containers. Yeah. I don't like that term because it makes it sound like you're giving a container a, a privilege of some sort. I like it more of a paroled container because <laughs> you're, you're, the purpose of the container is I'm jailing it to isolate it and virtualize the app so it can't see outside the space. But the super privileged containers can now take some of those namespaces and expose them like a gate so that the application can actually get to the host, you know, underlying namespace. So, but that's my term. It's on video, but that's not a right hat. <laughs> Paroled. <laughs> um, so, sorry, so Kubernetes is a language? Or it's, an or, it's an orchestration utility that has its own, it, you feed it YAML. So, okay. That then describes your application in terms of here are the containers, here are the ports it's using, and then it orchestrates the deployment of your application. Okay. That's Kubernetes is an that. application you feed it a text set of instructions. That's right. And That's Docker is also an application that then that then Kubernetes runs talks and actually executes the container. And Kubernetes talks to Docker to That's make right. that happen. Yes. That's right. So it's the, kind of like the objective is to get Somewhere. people away from using Docker commands, just like when we deployed you know KVM or, or Zen in, in RHEL 5, right? We created libvirt, the project libvirt, so that people wouldn't be using the, the Zen command line. Right? We wanted them using an, an abstracted, uh, portable, open source API for managing VMs. That's right. Same kind of concept. You know, even though Docker is really cool and strong and powerful, you, you kind of want to keep that dependency basically. away. So Kubernetes right now is the means to keep you out of the out of the weeds. And, if, and, and in particular, go. if you replace Docker with something else, you know, principle Kubernetes could then have the same functionality Absolutely. without a huge amount of. You're interfacing with the Kubernetes API, right? So it's a layer of so abstraction. So that's sort of what you expect. This to, I mean, if we're supposed to learn one thing, sort of best practices, you would say learn Kubernetes and let everybody else work out the Kubernetes to Docker or Kubernetes or whatever. Absolutely, yeah. So that's why, like, when you interface with CoreOS, you would interface with Kubernetes, not necessarily Rocket. So, you know, for all of you with your laptops, you know, playing with Docker is <coughs> straightforward and simple. You go find the readme that, you know, installs the bits that you need. You start downloading these, um, these, you know, from the registry, you start downloading your images and you say run. Those images aren't always built with the intent of being, you know, something deployable in a Kubernetes pod. It could be, you know, like, um, you know, hobbyist guy just wants to put Mongo or some other application in the container. Uh, there's you know, lots of things, and that brings up this topic, right? And it also kind of keeps your host system a little cleaner, right? And it absolutely keeps it cleaner. You know, I'm littered. If you, it, so a good example is here, right? If you wanted to pull MongoDB from Docker, right, using the Docker registry, that's um, what they're calling it. Uh, let's say you want to pull that container down. If you want to run Mongo, you just type in the Docker run command with that container of Mongo, and it's going to go off and run Mongo for you. But then once you want to destroy it, you'd run docker kill, give it the UID of the container, and it's going to get rid of it. 
and all of a sudden there's no more process running, if you want to remove Mongo from your system entirely, you would uh, remove the image Docker RMI. And that's a good way. So it does, to your point, it does keep the host system very clean. It really confines that user space into its own separate area. Yeah, I mean, I do a lot of GPU programming, and that makes a hash of things when you've got all kinds of, yeah. there's a case where the, there's a lot of particular driver versions and whatever. But. So, I mean, from some perspectives, right, the, the, the Docker format, like you said, becomes a very interesting packaging model. Because now I can bundle everything up into a deployable container, but you might still have dependencies. So, aside from all the the namespacing and making you you probably just like the packaging model. You can use the super privilege, you know, a set of commands to basically remove all the jails and then just pull your container and get access to all the hard bits. So that might be suitable. All right, so you know, talking about security and you know trusting the sources, if you go to the Docker registry and you go search for Mongo, you'll find that you know there's hundreds of actual packages you can pull down. So now it's like, well, who built it? What does the actual runtime include? Does, you know, does, is there some kind of a hidden Trojan that <coughs> can expose my company to, to something? Um, you know, and that's you know where, where Red Hat's been building its bread and butter for, for you know, a couple of decades now. Um, you know, we signed our RPMs. We've got QA and uh, deployment tech you know tools so that you as a company or as a customer can consume our products and feel confident that the packages you deploy came from Red Hat, they've gone through the QA process, it's been certified and tested, et cetera. So we're now applying that same principle to the container world where, you know, when you register a system with Red Hat, you know, we have our own registry to deliver the Red Hat OS <coughs> pieces. You can then also connect it to the Docker registry and you know, benefit from those as well. But over time, we're going to build up our library of tools and things that will uh, we'll be shipping from, from our registry. I think the, the, the two middle points on the certified containers are probably stuff that we've been talking about. Because, it, you know, so uh, to a point that was made earlier, when you talk about the enterprise portability, that's where we're guaranteeing that this container will run on this host. Uh, that's what we mean by that. Uh, the second thing is that the enterprise lifecycle, uh, one of the big sticking points for container adoption within enterprise now is if there is a security problem within the container, let's say there's a, a new poodle or uh, something else, you know, another shell shock exploit that comes out, who's on the hook to patch that? And Having, um, having that trust model of knowing that there is somebody on the hook to patch it, you know, maybe it's Red Hat or it's a trusted container that we have an agreement between Red Hat and the ISV that it's supported, it works, and we're gonna work with the ISV to patch it, you know, when there is a security flaw. Um, having, that, um, having that confidence that you can deploy and knowing that there is an enterprise lifecycle behind it, it just means that if you do get into a uh, model for deploying containers in your enterprise, you're not gonna get stuck and say, well, I've got 2,000 instances of uh, you know, Tomcat that all of a sudden it's exposed to this new shell shock bug because, you know, I, I didn't think about uh, what were the implications of people using containers in, in prod. So it's a, it's a big problem that's on the horizon that Red Hat's trying to solve. And another thing that's been challenging um, for enterprise companies, that, you know, you upgrade an operating system, oftentimes you're like, I need to roll that upgrade back out because I had a specific problem. Um, you know, since we've been talking about Docker and this whole image, it's in the container world, you're deploying an image. And with Docker, that format allows for <coughs> layering of images so that when you build your application, you can include a small you know, chunk of your app and then say the dependency for this app is a RHEL 6 image. And so you get the RHEL 6 base image, your container, when it gets deployed by Docker, it basically squishes the two together and then launches the container. When you patch it, you can either patch the base, or you can just come back with another layer that basically inserts itself and says, okay, here's the, the patches for OpenSSL or Heartbleed, whatever, right? So you come in with this layered approach, and that, again, extends the flexibility that if you want to, whoops, I need to back out that change, you can either remove that layer or remove the base OS and stick the old one back in. So this whole concept of uh, upgrading, testing, and then regressing those changes is a, is a you know, flip of a switch as opposed to, I just installed a bunch of RPMs, whoops, let me go to my tapes and start to reinstall the OS and recover things from. <coughs> yeah, no. But, no, no, no. Yeah. no but, but if you have some common library like OpenSSL library or something that's shared in multiple containers, now you have to go and upgrade the version of every single 
I think the, the to, before, if you just updated the OWASP, <coughs> you know, SSL, then you're done, right? So I think what, what Christoph was driving towards is that um, the, the host has this knowledge that when I have a Docker image, it has this layer on it that conforms to this OS. And when you have these different containers, the container format says, I'm a container, but I'm formed of all these different layers. You know, one layer is the RHEL 6, one layer might be, you know, the Apache binary, one layer might be like the HTTP stuff that goes in that. You know, so when you talk about patching like the RHEL 6 layer, you patch that once in terms of that layer, and you effectively re-kick the container. You're, you stop the process and restart it, it gets this whole new user space, and you're good to go. And you, you execute that without rebooting the host, right? Right. So, so there's a lot of pain that's removed. Yeah. Um, another thing, uh, when we talk about uh, Atomic shortly, um, in that model, you can upgrade the host while it's running and essentially put in a new base and then reboot the machine and upgrade the host. So you can basically upgrade the host while it's running doing things and then when you reboot, you get the updated image. But we'll get to that in a second. So now, this sort of these certified containers, are those something that Red Hat is charging money for or is that something they're making available for both? Or? That's, a, that's another good question. I think, uh, you know, so I understand this is going to be recorded on YouTube. Is, is the video careful. still on? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> can we just put out the video? Uh, so I think you know that's something where we're working with our ISV partners to figure out what the best model for that delivery mechanism is. Um, as it stands, I know that you know companies like uh, ISV partners that Red Hat's been working with, with for a long time, they are investing into containers. I don't think anyone's thought about uh, the business process beyond that. Right? Okay, but let's take, take something like Mongo or something which is clearly open source and GPL and everything. Sure, yeah. with, is Red Hat offering a certified container for that, for instance? Could they even charge for something? Yeah, I mean, to, to answer your question, as of right now, we are not charging for it. Uh, but what we are uh, what we are thinking about is um, providing, uh, using our subscription management system to help the ISVs provide a mechanism for which they would understand how customers deploy their apps. Could terminology. Could charge for it. Oh, they can. Even in the GNU model, you can't charge for yep. the software, but you can charge <coughs> for distribution of it. You can charge for documentation for it for a bunch of other things. Yeah. So that would be completely legal and charge for Yeah, but GPL only stipulates that you, when I ship you a binary, I have to ship you source code along with that. That is the stipulation that the GPL is. Right? I mean, you could you could charge for that container. You could charge to get that binary, but you have to ship source code along with that. That's the point. You can compile your own, which is where, where you end up on the untrusted container yeah. model. You're not sure like where you're getting it from, who's compiling it, what else, what other stuff they could be uh, putting into it. That's really where the model um, but then it also sort of allows that sort of almost a simpler, you can sort of standardize more of the host OS with fewer, as long as they talk to the container, right. and you can let people build their environments in there, and, and does it sort of simplify the host OS distribution? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that's that's why we developed Real Atomic, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Atomic is basically just enough operating system to run all the container frameworks that you need, and that's it. So if you're familiar with, the, like, say, ESXi, it's just yes. enough ESX that you know, basically become a hypervisor platform that plugs into uh, the <coughs> center. Um, in the KVM world of Red Hat uh, virtualization, we have something called Red H, which is just enough Red Hat to be a KVM hypervisor. Also a small footprint, deployable, you know, that kind of thing. Atomic is, like he says, just enough Red Hat Enterprise Linux to become <coughs> a Docker host. So was there a question about that? It's pre-configured oh. to do all the Kubernetes yeah. stuff, yes. Uh, is there any sort of management system in place to facilitate restarting a container with minimum downtime. What I'm thinking is if you had to upgrade SSL, you might want to keep the existing app up on port 80 for as long as possible up until the moment of a restart, but you don't want to drop any packets in between. So what I was thinking was you could like, you could have the container, let's say on a different port, have SOCAT or something forwarding the public port 80 down to the container, and then you could have like SOCAT switch which container was forwarding that port to as the restart happened. Is there anything like that built in right now? Um, so I think how, um, how most customers are trying to solve that problem is having effectively, uh, it's a distributed computing problem, so effectively putting a load balancer in front of it, letting the load balancer make those decisions of, oh, well, I can reach this host, I'm going to forward it there, and I can't reach it, I'm just going to forward it here instead. And then when everything does come available, that's, that's when it figures it out. That's why like things like OpenShift, which Christoph mentioned at the very beginning, it has that built-in load balancer to figure that out for you. Um, so it's doing all that decision making for you. Otherwise, uh, if you're just running a simple app with you know, one instance of Apache, one instance of MySQL, I mean, that's you know, one instance of whatever, right, your custom code. 
I think that's most applications that are out there. It's just like restarting HTTP, right? If you were to do that, you're shutting down the container, you're booting it back up, it's literally just like restarting the process. Are these going to be available on CentOS 7 as well? <coughs> There, there is an atomic variant of CentOS 7. Okay. Answer your question. How dare you get out? <laughs> <laughs> and does Fedora support any of this? Or? Yeah. There is an atomic variant of Fedora, although I think most of the work that's being done for atomic has shifted to CentOS atomic. Um, but yeah, so for, again, mentioning Project Kala, my demo for Project Kala was all done on Fedora. Do, if you get the atomic. Would, it, would you be able to get updates and patches for it and stuff, or would you need it? Like so th th there's a different mechanism for patching Atomic, which we were going to talk about in just a minute. Oh, sorry. But it does change. Um, it changes the way you manage the host. It's probably a good way to put it. Um, you're, you're no longer applying RPMs individually. You're applying entire system updates. Yeah. And that's what they call the Atomic update. So I'll let Chris off. Yeah. That's a good question, though. Okay, so let's see what we've covered here. Uh, isolation with Linux containers. We talked about the format with Docker, uh, orchestration with Kubernetes. Uh, we've touched on Atomic uh, and this concept of R uh, RPM OS trees. Um, and you're going to correct me if I get this wrong. But basically, when we talk about the <coughs> orthogonal set of technologies between RPM and this uh, imaging methodology with Docker containers, the way we build the Docker container is still leveraging the traditional tools like RPM. And then in conjunction with, oh, have that thing called RPM OS tree, that's what gets you from, I've got my environment with my runtime and my application to, here's my deployable container in the image. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I mean, with uh, it's, it's definitely changing the way you think about host management. Because most people, when they hook manage hosts, you're thinking about applying RPMs directly like I have this RPM that you know solves this um, you know security problem, and I'm going to pass that RPM directly within the OS tree model. You have to think about it like you're applying a system update where all these changes are going to occur at once, and then you basically restart the machine, and, and or, or or sometimes not doesn't always require a restart. Uh, like let's say if you had a change that required a kernel um, update, you'd apply this entire OS image, you would restart the machine. And there you go, that's your, uh, that's your really updated host. Who here is a software developer? So if we talk about continuous integration and continuous development, that's common terminology, <coughs> I'm surprised by that. Um, and you talk about like agile development versus you know, waterfall style. You know, I think what I've always heard is that you know, one of the primary reasons why lots of software projects fail is because you set up all your design goals in the beginning and then you go code for six months and then you realize you're broken and you've spent your budget and then project's done, right? Um, in the Agile model, you want developers to come up with really cool ideas, launch a container, do the development, test it, and basically validate in an hour that it's either a good idea or a bad idea, and they basically start coding in very small chunks and testing basically in, in real time. So this whole methodology fits right in with what uh, Agile development so, more than a container, right? So, like as I said, you can get Docker installed and launch a container and start to fiddle with it. But you know, when you talk about enterprise uh, scale and deployment and management of containers, you really need a lot more to think about. Um, let me just get to the big picture here. So, you know, Red Hat as a company, we're working with partners and. Uh, trying to certify ISV apps, build marketplace, um, have these registries to, so you can get uh, trust, trusted uh, images, um, and then also have the Kubernetes tooling. Um, talked about OpenShift. So OpenShift is our PaaS platform that's been around for a couple of years now, and we initially deployed it as a hosted solution, so there was nothing on-premise that you could do with OpenShift initially. It was something that we ran at Amazon that allowed Red Hat customers to start fiddling with, you know, developing. And um, when you signed up for this, you basically got a small container running on RHEL 6 at the time. There are pieces of, of the container, um, the plumbing, the, the, the capabilities in the kernel, which existed in, in RHEL 6, which was basically enough to make OpenShift um, a viable solution. And um, the way it worked is customer would sign up, swipe the card, say I need a, an OpenShift image, 
And then when they started their development, it looked and smelled and felt like their own dedicated operating system. But because of containerization, they're actually sharing a, an Amazon AMI uh, with 100 or 1,000 of the users. So again, it's a complementary technology to traditional VM um, virtualization. Um, so just big marketplace. Let's, I'm going to try and start rushing here, because we actually want to get to some demo, because I think that's where most of it's going to make more sense. Um, okay. So this is Atomic Host, minimized footprints. Uh, simplified maintenance and orchestration at scale. Basically, it comes pre-configured so that everything works with Kubernetes and it's basically meant for Docker, large scale, easy manageability. So, what does that mean? Um, Linux kernel, <coughs> SE Linux turned on, uh, still uses systemd, 2nd, all these things are part of RHEL 7, cooked in there. Uh, technologies like Kubernetes that we you're familiar with the Red Hat model, right? We deploy all the software in something we call a channel. So a lot of the bits and pieces show up in the extras channel. So Kubernetes, RPM, OS tree, Docker, those are all in the extras channel. So if you have uh, a RHEL subscription, you would have to enable those channels for the host and then just do a yum install for those components. But uh, anyway, that's all included in, in the uh, Atomic host. And we're applications on RHEL 7. So if you don't want to use Atomic, you can still use standard RHEL 7. In, so the channels just do a yell install of various pieces. Um, Basically, you would recommend if we're sort of starting from scratch to look forward to start with Atomic and sort of build up with Kubernetes. Depends, I guess. On yes and no. I mean, uh, the container is still the container. If you have, you know, RHEL or CentOS installed on your on your laptop, I don't see that you need to reinstall Atomic on there. But if you have KVM enabled. You can basically pull down, you know, the atomic host, install it into KVM, and start playing with it from there. Yeah, that's what I think most people are um, gravitating towards. Things like Vagrant, so they fit right that model. Yeah. Everybody familiar with Vagrant? No. <laughs> so Vagrant is a, a mechanism that uh, several people have created that effectively make it really easy to spin up these sandbox environments for testing applications. So uh, Vagrant on Mac, for example, will use things like virtual box um, to then create a sandbox environment where you're going to test. Uh, you can use an atomic image, so that way if you wanted to uh, uh, you know, deploy uh, what they call a Vagrant image, uh, that's basically the host that we talked about, the host OS, deploy a uh, you know, RHEL 7 or CentOS you're using the community, deploy that as a Vagrant image, and then deploy your app to container on top of that. Um, so that's one way to utilize Vagrant. Um, Wait, so Vagrant is like virtual box? Vagrant is a, it's it's like an a, API it's like a level virtual box. Uh, yeah. a, a level, if you think of it at a higher level so that you create an, an image that's a Vagrant image, yeah. and then you take it to your Mac, on Mac you would use whatever the virtualization platform is to run the Vagrant image. And then you pick it up from there and throw it in your Linux machine and have, and basically you would use KVM under the covers. Yeah. Pick it up from there and go to the next place. So you're, it basically creates a little bit more portability across platforms of an image. Why wouldn't you just install Atomic in VirtualBox? You could do that too. Do. I think the, what's the advantage of Vagrant? It's more portable to other... Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's like one command line to do all that. That's really what Vagrant does. 